Welcome to EdShift, everyone. Um, I see we've got a few people who are joining us again who were here with us last year. We took a little bit of a break over the summer, but we are back and we are back on our twice a month schedule. So as you guys know, in EdShift, we like to dive into a teaching practice, examine why it matters for students, and look at those best practices. And then we turn that into a lesson and walk you through what that could feel like from the student perspective. At the end of the webinar, I give us 48 hours and you will receive an email from me and it will go to the email address that you registered for the webinar with. And it will include the recording of this webinar. It will include the presentation, the lesson that I shared and my where to go next bibliography of a couple of great resources that you might want to check out if you want to learn a little bit more about culturally relevant teaching. For those of you who haven't been here before, um, I'm Chris Astle. I'm an education strategist with Smart Technologies. I am a former high school teacher. My background is in teaching science uh, and English as a second language, both in Switzerland and in the United States. Uh, and my passion is really at finding the skills that everyone has deep inside and helping them share those with everyone else around them. And I am very, very fortunate to be joined by Katie Novak today. Katie, can you share a little bit about yourself? Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. Really thrilled to be here with you this season. Um, I am also part of the LEARN team here at Smart Technologies. Um, I have a background in uh, recreation and leisure studies, so outdoor education, museum education. Um, and so certainly this conversation around cultural relevance is, is near and dear to my heart. And um, also really just passionate about education overall. You know, similar to Chris, we... Um, we are here at SMART um, because we believe in the power of education and uh, the power of, of our students and our next generations to, uh, to change uh, and, and in some cases save the world. So uh, glad to be here, Chris. Thanks. I love it. I'm so excited that you're going to be joining me this season on EdShift. So today we are talking about how to develop a culturally relevant and responsive classroom. This is a topic that I think I could probably lead a year's worth of webinars on. Um, and Katie's going to try to keep me on track today because there's so many things that I'm passionate about when it comes to this topic and so many things that I'm interested in. And when I was kind of thinking about where I wanted to go and what I wanted to share in this webinar, I was doing plenty of reading and I couldn't nail down the, do we talk just about being relevant or do we talk just about being responsive? So we're really going to dive into both. And I'm hopefully going to talk a little bit about what both terms mean and how they are similar and how they maybe diverge slightly. Um, there's a lot going on in our worlds as we go back to school. And there's a lot that as we, you know, navigated through pandemic teaching and emergency teaching and, all of the things that happened, you know, in all of our respective countries last year, I think we, we saw things in a different light. We understood things differently. And I know I'm headed back into the school year, really thinking about what can I do to change? What are the small steps I can make? What are the big changes I can make to make sure that every student who comes into a classroom is seeing themselves in that space, is connecting to the learning, and is finding ways to grow and excel. And so you're going to see that theme kind of play out throughout all of our webinars this year. Um, but today, we're really going to focus in on how to be culturally relevant and responsive in the classroom. The flow today, as always, I'm going to give you an overview of what is culturally responsive um, and relevant teaching. And then we're going to dive into the best practices. And then at the end, I am going to give you guys a lesson example. Now, I do want to get a little bit of involvement today. So um, let me get you guys signed into my class before we go too much further. So um, if you can go to hellosmart.com, just open up another tab, another device, whatever you're comfortable with. You're going to join as a guest and you're going to enter my class ID, which is 979-887. There is not a space uh, so just six numbers all in a row. Um, and Katie, I can tell, is typing and putting that in the chat. Talking about the new year, um, what I want to just get a temperature check on before we dive into this is when you think about your students, some of you may already be back in school. Some of you may still be ramping up to go back to school. But for this coming school year, what are the greatest needs of your students as we head back to school? So take a minute and share that. And Katie, 
you can maybe share with us what you're seeing on some of this. I know you've done a ton of work with uh, some of our students through our partnership with Digital Promise. So Mm -hmm. share a little bit. Yeah, definitely. In in talking directly to our students and also in in some of the the research and and work that we've done with teachers over the last few months, I mean, relationships. Relationships are coming up over and over again. Students need to reconnect with each other. They need to reconnect with their teachers. Um, And I'm, I'm definitely seeing that here too, right? That idea of connecting with friends, that social emotional support. You know, students have been through a lot in the last year and a half, um, you know, and and they have had varying levels of support in their homes, varying, uh, you know, things to to deal with, certainly. Um, So really that idea that they're all coming with these unique, um, unique needs, different needs than they had 18 months ago uh, in the classroom. So yeah, really that idea of of relationships and, and reconnecting and building that trust again with students. Yeah, I love that. And we're seeing that in our responses here too, like this need for connection, social and emotional support, um, socializing, empathy, understanding, social interaction, you know, everyone really is in a different place. And I think these last 18 months have really, you know, given our students a lot of different things and different experiences and they're coming back and there's going to be gaps. Like I see learning loss on here and we know that there's some unfinished learning, but there's also all of these unexpected skills that students acquired while they, you know, were learning from home or learning in a way that they hadn't before. And so I think, you know, making sure we recognize our students as individuals. It's going to be one of the themes of our webinar today and providing them the support that they need. Um, And again, you know, just embracing their strengths, building those connections, and then helping connect the learning to those experiences that they're coming with. So this is great. I love all of the responses that I'm getting on here. Um, Love seeing that someone put in play, Chris. I think that's such an easy thing that we can forget about regardless of, you know, if we're talking about littles or high school students or uh, frankly, even adults, um, you know, our, our opportunities for play and engaging uh, with the world in that way have been limited this last year. So the idea that, yeah, we need to make sure that not only do students have time to accelerate their learning and engage with us, but they need to play. They need to experience the world uh, with a with a sense of, of wonder uh, too, again, that would have been challenging over the last year. And when you think about the brain science behind that too, like play is how our kids, especially our littles, you know, process the themes of their life around them. And so there's plenty to process. And so I love, you know, making space for that um, to happen in our classrooms. I love that. Um, This is an amazing page. And I feel like I will be coming back to visit all of the great things you guys have contributed here. So I wanted to kind of start this off. Um, I always start with a quote for those of you who are new. And I was really reflecting on what I wanted to start with today. And I picked this African proverb. I am because we are. Because I really wanted to to focus a lens on kind of the idea of collectivism, the idea of how when we work with our students in the classroom, that we are all doing this together, that our students are helping each other achieve, that we are teaching our students, but our students are teaching us, that everything that happens is the cycle of sharing and growing and connecting to each other. And so... I want us to keep this in our mind as we kind of move through today, this this idea that none of us are anything without the rest of us. So two books that if you haven't read, uh, you definitely should, um, and that were really influential in the information that I pulled together today. So the first one is The Dream Keepers. Um, This was published in 2009. Uh, A lot of you may be familiar with it, but it is no less relevant, you know, this many years later. Uh, Dr. Ladson Billings really did some amazing work and some pioneering work, and I definitely recommend that you read this. Um, And then Zaretta Hammond, I absolutely love. I listen to her at every opportunity that I can. Uh, And the scientist and the nerd in me really enjoyed culturally responsive teaching in the brain because she really takes a deep dive into like, what is the brain science? Like when we do this, What is it doing for our students and how is it benefiting them? And honestly, it's just about good teaching. So um, I will be referencing these books both throughout our webinar today. But if you haven't read them, I wholeheartedly recommend checking them out. All right, 
right. So let's look at a few definitions. We are going to look at culturally relevant teaching and that definition first. We'll explore that a little bit. And then I'm going to kind of hop into how is that different when we talk about um, Zaretta Hammond's definition of culturally relevant as well. So Dr. Ladson Billings talks about culturally relevant teaching as a teaching that empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by working with and affirming that student's culture and lived experiences to impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So when I try to put that in my words and think about it in you know, my classroom and what we taught there, it really is teaching students to, to think, but doing it through their own knowledge and their own experiences and approaching them and letting them interact with the learning in a way that makes sense to them. And so there's a, a quote that was actually shared in her book. Um, uh, I'm trying to think here. Jane Adams, who was a social worker over a hundred years ago, uh, said that ignoring a child's cultural context distances them from the authorities in their world and leaves them rudderless in the perilous business of living. So we can't separate our students from the learning. We can't separate the learning from their community. And so a story that I think of um, when I look at this definition, when I first moved back to the United States and started teaching, um, I came back in the middle of the year and I joined a school and the classes that I took over had been through four teachers before I got there. Uh, they didn't have a classroom. They were kind of like fit into a hallway between four other rooms. And it was in an inner city high school. And the majority of my students were African-American students. And I was teaching them science and they saw no connection and no relevance to that content and their experience and their lives around them. I probably learned more than they did that year. Um, but the connection I made really quickly is if I couldn't teach them the content in a way that they saw themselves in, in a way that made sense in their world, like what bearing does this information or this learning have, what happens to me today, tomorrow, and 10 years from now, then I couldn't engage them. And then it became this battle of compliance and trying to get them to do what we thought they should do in school when they saw no reason to be there. And so as we kind of talk through uh, some of the strategies today, um, some of that, some of those learnings that I had there will definitely come through. So when we talk about a culturally relevant concept of knowledge, um, one of the things that we wanna keep in mind is that knowledge is not static. Knowledge is constantly changing. And like for me in science, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like we're constantly discovering new things, we're iterating on, we're moving forward. But that's true across the spectrum. So knowledge is constantly recreated, recreated recycled, and shared by students. We need to co-construct knowledge in our classrooms with our students. We need to not always be the expert because our students know things that we don't. And giving them a voice to share that and pull that into the learning is incredibly important. Also, this idea that knowledge is viewed critically, to have a lens of questioning, of thinking, of making connections, of pushing, of iterating, um, so that nothing is ever static and nothing is ever unchanging. And then really thinking about our definition, definition of excellence as something that is complex, it is not one size fits all, and it takes our student diversity and individual differences into account. Who are these different students? What are they bringing with them to the classroom? And what drives them to be excellent? I think, Chris, sometimes it's easy to look at this idea of cultural relevance of like, oh, we're just talking about, you know, we're just talking about race. We're just talking about one element and really making sure that we are looking at our students and the, the intersectionality of them as individuals and everything that they bring to the table. You know, it would have been super easy for you to, to walk into that inner city classroom and go like, OK, yeah, you know, these kids are black. I know all I need to know. There's so much variability and the idea that students need to know that that intersection of who they are, all of that matters and they matter. Exactly. So culturally responsive teaching in contrast to culturally relevant teaching really kind of takes this brain science um, into consideration as well. So it's a very subtle difference. And so as Retta Hammond and Geneva Gay have both shared a lot in this area, 
but it really focuses on using the brain's memory systems. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about neuroscience as we move forward, but taking those memory systems, taking those information, information processing centers, thinking about how they're culturally used. What are the frames of references? What are the performance styles of our ethnically, ethnically diverse students? And how do we use those to make learning more relevant and effective? And so here and in a lot of um, Hammond's work, you'll see there really is this focus on oral traditions. A lot of our ethnically diverse cultures have a very strong oral tradition and finding ways to build that into the classroom, finding ways for students to access information other than just reading. And then thinking about the definition of literacy, right? Like we think literacy mm -hmm. and we immediately kind of make the jump to, to reading, but literacy is really how we engage with all of the ways our culture communicates. And so, you know, as we think about how we're literate now, right, there's digital literacy, you know, being literate with computers and technology has evolved. There's lots of ways to share. And there's lots of things our students are better at than we are. Um, and letting them bring that to the classroom, not being afraid of that, not being afraid to not be the expert. So we think about all of the ways that we can help our students process the information by looking at the brain science behind it. But then we also see our students as individuals and as experts who can bring that knowledge to the classroom and share it with us as well. I'm just excited that we get to talk about neuroscience too, Chris. This is great. I know. <laughs> My favorite topic. Anytime we can bring neuroscience into it, it is amazing. So let's think about learning in the brain for just a minute. So we are all learners and we are all constantly learning, even when it looks like we're not. And so, you know, think about the students in our classroom. By nature, we are curious and by nature, we want to be connected to each other. We know from like Vygotsky's work, um, that learning is social and language is, you know, how we learn by talking, by sharing, by connecting to each other's. And we are innately curious. And so capitalizing on those things, finding ways to, you know, get our students a little bit more curious about what we're teaching by connecting it to them as individuals and to their larger community. Um, and kind of going back to this idea that we started with in the beginning of, you know, collectivism, a lot of our students, it's not just them. They're not individuals. There's this whole group of community and family behind them. And making those connections inspires them, engages them, and gets them present in what we are doing in our classrooms. And I think there's an idea here that, of course, goes beyond the classroom as well, right? If we are, you know, enabling and inspiring these ideas of curiosity and, and connectedness in terms of how students approach the world, that's going to serve them well as they engage in politics, as they engage in, you know, other types of civic duties as they go through their lives understanding that, you know, their, their knowledge is important, but also that, that coaching almost on, on being curious to the world around them will continue to serve them through their lives. The whole notion of like, what if, what if this happened or what if that happened? What, you know, how do we explore and iterate? And that curiosity is really tied to like experimentation through and then failing to get to the next step. And so it's this whole mindset of like, let's push the button. What happens, <laughs> right? Um, when I think too, like of all of the very successful, deep thinkers who have done, you know, really amazing things, they're all unstoppably curious. They're the people who like walk into a room and push all of the buttons. And why would we want to replace that with compliance, right? I mean, that completely deadens this idea of thinking. And so when we think about curiosity, you know, let's connect that to student thinking. Let's teach them to think. Let's balance the practice and thinking that they have in the classroom and remind them that school is a place that they come to think, to iterate, to try, to fail, because that is how we all learn together. Yeah, not just to, to memorize and check the boxes. Right. So why does all of this matter? Um, obviously you guys believe that it does because we've got quite a few of you joining us here today. But when we really take the time to think about how we can incorporate culturally relevant and responsive instruction into our classrooms, all of our students are going to benefit. So our students' sense of identity is strengthened when they see themselves and they see their world and then they make those connections to what they already know and what they're learning 
and back to their community, they really develop a strong sense of identity. And that sense of identity is going to help steer them through the world around them. We think about a lot of our students, you know, there are things happening in their lives that are hard and having this, you know, the rudder, right? The, the pathway to move forward and navigate those is incredibly important. Um, developing and supporting critical thinking skills. So really emphasizing the thinking, the learning, the analyzing, the questioning, the, you know, why is this? Whose reality is this? Whose truth is this? How does this connect to me? And how does this kind of trickle into everything around me? So not learning anything in a vacuum, but starting to look at learning through the context of our immediate world and the larger world around us. Students are going to be engaged in the learning. When they, any student, when they can see themselves in the learning, when they can make those connections, that is what is going to get them to be there, to show up, to talk, to be involved. All of our students are going to build cultural competence through this. They will have the opportunity to see the world through someone else's eyes and start to understand bias and differences and how to navigate that. And, you know, if we're not doing that in our classrooms, where is it going to happen? And through that, we're going to strengthen this classroom community where we as a class do things together. We help each other and we succeed because of each other. And everyone's contribution is critical to that success. And I think we do a lot of individual work in schools and then we go out into the real world and there's not a lot of individual work. It's that ability to bring your talent to know and advocate for the value you can bring and to mesh it in with everyone else's to create that kind of final goal. And so I think that's a really important skill for our students to develop as well. And so it's not that we are, you know, decorating our room or talking about food or festivals or anything like that. Like that is not what this is. Culturally relevant and responsive teaching is really those connections that we build between the students who sit in our classroom, but those students between each other with a teacher and those students, and then immediate community, larger community world beyond us, which really makes our students successful. And there's a great comment in the chat, uh, Chris from Dawn noting about, you know, how do, how do students feel left, like they fit in with society? Do they feel like they're left out? Do they feel like they have a place in the world or that their contribution matters at all? And, you know, that's why this, this foundation that we can build for them in the classrooms is so vital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think a lot about, you know, developing self-efficacy in students. If the student can't see a pathway for success because they don't see themselves represented in what is happening in the classroom, then we don't have that chance of building self-efficacy. But when students can identify with and when they can see how the piece of information or the expert skill that they bring furthers the learning of everyone else, then, yeah, that web of connection starts to develop. So brain science, my favorite page, and <laughs> Katie's too. So when we think about chemically what happens in our brain, there are things that happen that help us learn, and there are things that happen that stop us from learning. So when these chemicals are released, one of two things will happen. So if I am releasing oxytocin and dopamine in my brain, I am relaxed. I feel psychologically safe. I'm able to, you know, divert the attention to learning instead of worrying about, you know, myself and the world around me. And so things that build that conversation, talking, um, having students teach each other, having students share with each other, having that constant flow of conversation through relationships, through learning is going to release the oxytocin and dopamine. And if you think about it, right, when you're really successful at doing something uh, or when you've had a really great conversation with someone you're happy and relaxed and you've got a little bit of energy right afterwards. And that's the oxytocin and the dopamine that really bring you to a place where you can make those connections, where you can take existing ideas that you have and connect new ones to them and start to build those neural pathways. Now, the opposite is when you come to a classroom and you don't feel safe. So when you feel like you don't fit in, when you feel like there's some sort of threat there, when there are microaggressions that go unrecognized by the teacher who is controlling that classroom, your fight or flight response kicks in. And so your brain starts releasing cortisol and adrenaline and all of your energy, uh, 
physical and mental is diverted because you now are protecting yourself. You are defending from a threat and you're not able to actually learn. And depending on the student and their personality, that could manifest in a lot of ways. It may be the student who just puts his or her head down on their desk because they can't engage anymore. Um, It could be the student who refuses to do the work. It could be the student who walks out of the room. It can be the student who becomes, you know, verbally or physically confrontational because they've been pushed this far. Um, And I was listening to a podcast, which I will include um, in the email afterwards uh, with Saretta Hammond. um, And she was talking about how, you know, students process so many of these microaggressions that aren't recognized until they get to a breaking point. And now we're disciplining the student who we haven't allowed to access the learning because of just where they were in that brain space. And so when we create a classroom where we build a community where every student has a voice and is valued, we shift this balance to these positive chemicals in our brain, which really allow us to learn together as a team. And so it may seem like a small thing, but if you think about times when you've been in either one of these situations, I know, you know, when I'm upset or when I'm feeling stressed, you know, I can't learn. I can't create, I can't produce. uh, I become a hot mess. You can't, you know, interact with other people. And that's true for our students too. And Katie, I'm sure you have some to share on this page as well, since this is one of our favorite (laughs) topics. (laughs) Definitely. One of many, but one thing I I want to um, pull out from the chat as well that Catherine mentioned is the idea that, you know, this is also, there's also generational ideas here. You know, we are talking about the students who are in our classroom today, but part of, you know, being responsive to them is understanding that they're showing up to our classroom with generational trauma that looks very different for everyone um, and I think there's been people that you know it's, it's easy for people to shy away from culturally responsive teaching from having these deep important conversations in their classroom because they're worried about the purple bubble they're worried about you know what if what if I'm re-traumatizing my students by having these conversations but how do I know if I'm doing it right um, you know and I think that's I think if someone's considering that, um, if if you already have that thought process, um, you're probably on the right track already. But, you know, there's there's ways that we can do this that really are are about involvement and inclusion um, and don't have to go into into territory that can be re-traumatizing for our students. And I think that's a great point that could send me off in like a gazillion different rabbit holes. But yeah, a couple of things I want to pull out there is, is, you know, thinking about the activities that we plan, Um, like it's back to school and we have all of these get to know you back to school activities. What is the question you're asking of your students? And what is the lens through which you formulated that question? We sometimes, you know, look for this kind of like positive thing. What did you do over the summer? Like, where did you go? What was the you know best thing that happened to you? And so the, those types of questions, depending on the backgrounds our students can come from to that point can be very traumatizing. So when you think about the ways you want to engage with your students, how can you do that in a way that allows your student to share their greatness, their expert skills, the places where they want to contribute and not rank them or rate them in some other system based on what they've done or where they've been. So I think that that is incredibly important. And I think the second piece to that is never dismiss your students. Don't, there's so many things that happen in the classroom, right? Like when we see or hear a microaggression, it's very easy to dismiss it because diving into it seems to put us into the purple bubble. But having this classroom community where we've set grounds for how we interact with each other and holding true to that and not tolerating, but also hearing our students. Do not dismiss a student's idea. Let them share it. Let them develop it. Let them do the thinking and, you know, bring everyone's voice in. And those are the ways that I think we can start to think about making every student feel like they belong because it's that sense of belongingness that eliminates that psychological trauma and threat and makes the classroom a place where all of our students can contribute. All right, Katie, I'm going to try to keep us on time. This is such a great (laughs) conversation. Um, All right. So before we jump any farther into best practices, I'm going to start another shout it out. Um, And I want to have you guys just give me really quickly, like in one or two words, 
what does a culturally responsive classroom look like to you? I love the responses written. So interactive, open to student ideas, everyone being heard and feeling ready to learn, empathetic, diverse. Classroom material reflects the community, a place where creative confidence is developed, inclusive and engaging. I love all of this. Like student voice and choice is one of my favorite topics. And I'm always looking for ways to let students kind of, you know, share their individual greatness in the learning that they're doing. Awesome, some really good stuff here. And like, I see individualism and I love this. Like, how do we, how are we all individuals? How are we unique and respected and cared for? And how do we fit into the whole as well? And um, there's a quote I wanna share from Dream Keepers before we leave this page. And this is um, one of the teachers who was involved in the Dream Keepers study. And she's talking about one of her students. And what she says is he's strong and beautiful, but fragile. I have to build a safe and secure place for him and let him know that we, the class and I, will be there for him. The school has been placing him in the kitchen junk drawer. I want him to be up there in the china cabinet where everyone can see him. And the student that she's talking about in this quote um, had been held back for two years. He was older, he was often disruptive, and he had also wished, witnessed the drive-by shooting of his aunt. So here's a kid who has a lot of trauma and who had a lot of behaviors that were not necessarily conducive to the classroom. But what this teacher is talking about is, you know, finding his greatness, finding the things that he can do um, and letting the rest of the class look up and learn from him. And so it's kind of flipping the narrative, right? When students come into our classroom, understanding the whole student and what's behind them and what drives them and what's in there and looking at them from a different lens to let them share their greatness and their levels of expertness and to be able to give something back to that classroom community because every student in our rooms has something to give back to that community. So I love all the things that we're seeing here. Um, I am going to jump us ahead to best practices because I don't want to run out of time to walk you guys through at least some of our lesson today. Um, so when we're talking about best practices. Uh, Zaretta Hammond really talks about this being chaotic. It is a renovating and there is no renovation that has ever happened in the history of time that did not make a giant mess and cause a lot of chaos and result in something beautiful and amazing. And so when you're thinking about the shifts you can make in your classroom and the things that you can do, and when you're kind of, you know, examining the lens at which you look at your students, it's not going to happen overnight. We're not immediately going to get there. It's a process. And I think we need to, to allow for that. Um, and, you know, we have to give ourselves grace as well as giving our students grace and identify also like where we're growing, what our strengths are and what we bring to the table. Chris, I'll add another quote to that that has been in my mind a lot lately since someone shared it with me a few weeks ago, and that is evolution requires confusion. Um, you know, it requires a little confusion, it requires a little mess, but it means that we're moving in the right direction. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. Um, well, and you know, the Maya Angelou quote that I think about often, um, and I feel like I share with my own daughter uh, very frequently, is that we, we do our best until we know better. And then we continually strive and grow. And so I think that's important to keep in mind as well. So in the best practices segment of today, I've built, I've brought, blah, I can't talk. I've broken it down into two segments. Like number one, what are the best practices for building classroom community? And then what are the best practices for structuring some of our learning activities with our students? And so, you know, we've talked pretty much nonstop about community since we started today. Um, and so really thinking about how to develop that community. And as we're heading into back to school, like now is the time where we really set a lot of those expectations for our students, the ground rules for interactions in our classroom, and thinking about how we can collaboratively establish that learning environment and the classroom protocols that we have. And so when we think about giving every student a voice, let your students share like what they respect, what are the characteristics that are important to them and take a step beyond just having them share, ask them to share what that looks like because that may be different for all of our individual students. 
and letting, hearing from them what they respect and what they look up to and what they like to see mirrored in their classroom is really important. And then developing those protocols where we make sure that everything we do allows for every student to have our voice and recognizing that voices are different and that we have students who may be emerging language speakers. We have students whose strengths may not be in sharing verbally, but they may have strengths in other ways. And so making sure that our, our protocols allow for all of those students to have a voice in a way that works for them. And then, you know, helping students see their potential by setting high expectations. And so for a lot of these students who are coming to our classroom, society maybe doesn't have high expectations for them, but we can talk about that. We can be open about that with them and we can let them know that we do have high expectations and that we're going to let them succeed and help them succeed by making sure that we always clearly communicate our learning targets and success criteria. Make sure everyone has a roadmap that they can see, understand, and connect to. Um, celebrate all students, always, always. Um, every student has something to bring to the classroom uh, and making them all feel how important those contributions are. Our students, especially this year, they are coming to us from all over the place. And so meet them where they are and develop systems for intervention. So catch those gaps and find ways to help accelerate students past them. And in a classroom where we really facilitate student-to-student -student interactions and where we facilitate student teaching and where, you know, students teach others and teach the entire class, like those are our systems. And we have a community where instead of valuing individual contributions, it is most important that the community succeeds. It is most important that everyone learns. When we set that community and that expectation, then we have a room full of brains who are thinking, who can help each other. Um, and so it doesn't have to be a daunting task that, you know, we as teachers are single-handedly taking on for every individual in our classroom. This is a community. We can all help each other. Every student has something to give and they can all work together. And then involving parents, you know, letting parents understand what is happening in your classroom, what they can expect, understanding, you know, what have, what have parents taught their teacher or taught their students? How have they taught their students? And connecting that to your students themselves, ask them, what are your skills? What are your interests? What do you have to offer? And make sure that that is really amplified in the classroom. And that creates this community where everyone is excited to be there. Everyone helps each other achieve. And we have the space that has lots of oxytocin and dopamine and learning can take place. So when we think about connecting students to learning themselves, so um, Inspired Chunk to Review, I absolutely love this. This is from uh, Zaretta Hammond's book and it gives us kind of a simple model to follow when we think about how we present information to our students. So the inspire piece, right? Like how can we storytell? How can we connect the learning to what's happening in the world around our students? How can we get them interested so that they're ready to learn. And then making sure that, you know, we're delivering it in small pieces and we're giving them the opportunity to take those pieces and not just practice, but also think. So that's the chew, like really start to ask questions, to poke around with that learning, to connect it to things they know and things they want to know. And then the review piece, giving them time for practice. It takes a lot of work to get things permanently stored in our brain. And so making sure that our students have the opportunity to practice things, to revisit things, to reconnect things they've learned previously to the things they're learning now is going to help them feel successful. And that is really you know, firmly rooted in the brain science piece. And so, you know, when we think about oral traditions, you know, as we're engaging students, using storytelling, letting students storytell, letting them put it in their own words, letting them create, you know, written representations, be it poetry, be it a song, be it a story um, that connects to the learning, making sure that we activate and share prior knowledge and helping students make the connection between each other's prior knowledge, like all of the things we know how do they tie together? How do we let students think and analyze that thread and start to make those connections in their brain? And then taking all of that and connecting it to the actual experiences that students have in the world around them. That's gonna keep them connected. 
And then from there, you know, when we work together, make learning contextual. So uh, in a minute, I'm going to jump you guys into a lesson on photosynthesis uh, because I picked the topic because pretty much every student I've ever taught wanted to know why they had to learn this because it couldn't possibly have anything to do with their life. And so looking at the ways that we can make all learning contextual, so get students to understand why it's relevant and how it's relevant to them. Always building on the skills students already, already know um, so that they can connect that to the new learning. Doing lots of cooperative learning. So if you've been to any of my webinars ever, you know how much I love Think, Pair, Share and, and Jigsaw and strategies like that but really emphasizing the cooperative piece of it. This is not just group work to be done, which falls into kind of that basket of compliance, but that I as an individual am not successful unless my group is successful. And how do we all bring the things we know together to make something bigger? And then giving students space to solve problems and raise questions, even if they're questions we don't have the answer to. Um, I think that can be terrifying. It was terrifying for me when I first started teaching, when students asked things, particularly about science, that I didn't know. But that's a great opportunity for us to investigate together, to solve that problem and to get it wrong. Like if we don't get things wrong with our students and we don't let them see that, you know, that is how iteration works. All great things failed many times before they were great. And so giving the space for that to happen in your classroom and for every student to come from a different angle and a different approach that is recognized as equally valid. And then, you know, developing student voice. So, you know, allow students to co-construct knowledge. I do not have to teach my students everything. We can learn together. We can bring the pieces back and we can discuss them. We can chew on them together and see where they're going to take us next. And while we're building this, you know, environment of, you know, cooperative learning of, you know, this group dynamic, we also need to teach our students to question group thinking. So there's always that kind of critically analytical drive behind things. Um, and the same with knowledge, like get our students to view knowledge critically, to ask questions, to, you know, start at point A and get all the way to point Z, to really think things through. Um, and while we're doing this, we're going to create the opportunities for students to become the teacher, for them to walk us through their version of it and, you know, let us see it through their eyes. I think that's super important. And I love that idea of, of developing their voice, Chris. We're not giving them a voice. They have it already, but we're making sure they know how to use it. Exactly. And we're, you know, remembering that we're going to learn from them. They bring skills that we don't have and they will make us better people as well. Like this is a two-way street. And when our students start to feel that, right, the respect we have and the interest we have in the things they know and the things they can do, that just strengthens that community even further. All right, so summing it all up into four things before we jump into our lesson, you know, create that community of learners who teach and learn from each other. Make learning social with an emphasis on class success and not individual success. Cultivate the unique skills and the assets that students bring with them and maintain high expectations for students, but provide the scaffolding to help them reach them. So now in 16 very short minutes, we are going to jump into a lesson. So if you're not already signed into my class, you may want to um, so that you can kind of see what this would look like from a student's perspective. Really quickly, here is my class code again. It is 979-887. And we are going to jump into a lesson on photosynthesis. So on the very first page of this lesson, I want to kind of set the stage for my students about we are learning about photosynthesis so that we can understand the world around us and how it impacts our lives. For sure, there are standards on what we need to know about photosynthesis. I know them well. But what I really tried to do here is think about this through the lens of my students. And I really kind of thought back to my experience teaching, you know, inner city high schoolers about photosynthesis. They really did not connect to it initially. And so I had to think about ways to get them to make those connections. So the first thing I do in this lesson um, is get students to tell me what they think. So this is um, an activity I call a mood meter and I always set it up as a whole class activity. 
And what I have students do in this is I've got my graph um, and we've got two axes. We've got the how much you know. So we've got know a lot, know nothing. And then, but I'm curious about it or I'm not curious. I want my students to know it's okay to let me know that they think something is uninteresting or they're not connected to it. I think that's super important. So in this activity, I get my students to pick a picture that represents photosynthesis based on what they know already um, and to put it on the axes. So pick a quadrant um, that shows me where they land on photosynthesis. Um, and this is just giving them voice. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're not going to learn it, but it helps me understand where my students are coming from. And it also, when I think about my class as a group that is all working together, I love smiley face for photosynthesis, by the way. Um, I can then go back and pick my students from the different quadrants and pair them in ways that they can help each other be successful. So I can make sure that uh, all of my kids who are neither curious nor know anything about photosynthesis are not necessarily put in the same place. And so this is just, um, it's activating not necessarily prior knowledge, it's activating just the mindset that my students are coming to class with. All right, I'm gonna move through this a little bit quickly. So I apologize if you're putting something amazing on my page as I'm changing it. Um, but what I want to do then is talk about why it matters. So instead of talking about photosynthesis as a process, like there's an equation, it's messy, we'll get to it. I want to talk to it. Uh, I want to talk about it in the context of their world. So photosynthesis matters to us because it's how energy is captured and brought into our ecosystem. Without plants photosynthesizing, all of the energy in the sun that fuels our planet is not going to be absorbed by those of us who can't photosynthesize. It also stores that energy, which we know because we eat lots of plants. We'll find them on our dinner table. And if we're not eating the plant, we are eating something that ate a plant or ate something else that had a plant. So when we think of energy and the energy that drives us forward, photosynthesis is pretty important. Photosynthesis produces oxygen. And so here I'll talk to my class and get them to, you know, tell me why is oxygen important? So here we're going to activate some prior knowledge. We're going to talk about that. And then I'm going to talk about carbon dioxide removal. And again, activating prior knowledge, seeing how much my students know about the impact of carbon dioxide buildup in the environment. But I pull them through all of these things and start to connect them to the air that they breathe and the food that they eat. So we've made some of these connections. And honestly, in a classroom, this potentially could be, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of discussion as we talk about these things. And I ask my students for examples about oxygen, carbon dioxide, energy, how this matters to them, how it happens in their daily life. And I let them go on some of the tangents. So this is really just about building those connections and talking about the process. And again, remember, we want to inspire students. We want to give them small bits and let them play with it before we move them forward. And so that's a lot of what this lesson is about. So after we've kind of established the things that photosynthesis does that connects us to them, we're going to start to connect photosynthesis to our community. And I'm going to do that by putting my students in cooperative teams. So here I just set my students up and I'm going to put them in groups of kind of a smaller size. So like three to four in all of those groups. And then in this workspace, what they're going to be doing is starting to give me examples of um, how our community benefits from photosynthesis. So I've broken it down into the four boxes that we talked about already. And then I'm gonna have them work together to reflect their shared learning of how they are benefiting from that. So again, just building that connection because if we're not interested in photosynthesis, the equations that come later are not going to help us. So then I want them to learn something new. And here I've got an activity where I have them picking a podcast. So instead of having my students go out and read things um, or search the internet and find all kinds of interesting information, I want them to listen. Because again, thinking about that oral tradition, uh, thinking about the oxytocin that's actually released when we're listening to something and we're engaged in it, I want them to do that. And I want to make my students who maybe aren't reading as proficiently still have the ability to access that information. I also want them to have voice and choice. So on the next page, I have a whole slew of podcasts they can choose from. And I'm just gonna move them through some stages of sharing and organizing that. So they'll listen to the podcast of their choice. They'll do a think pair share and share that learning with their peer. Then they'll go back to their team that we did um, the four score activity on on the previous page and they'll update their graphic organizer so that their learning increases. And then I'll have all of those groups share with the class. So then letting all of us learn from each other 
in different ways so that everyone's voice is coming through. Um, podcasts that I pick here are from ListenWise, which is a great place to um, grab a podcast. Tumble, Kids Learn, there's tons of places out there with kids approved podcasts. Um, and so you just have to find ones that you have access to or that work for you. But I've just got these in here as links so my students can click on, you know, one that sounds interesting to them. Uh, and it's a whole range of topics. So I thought about my four quadrants and, you know, how that impacts their community. And now I'm just kind of trying to get them to make some of those connections on their own through listening to these stories here. From there, they do a think pair share. So I have them work individually in a handout to talk about what they learned and then to actively listen to their partner and record what their partner learned. So just getting them practicing some of those skills there together, you know, solid cooperative learning. And then we start exploring more about photosynthesis, but not until I've made the connection to the world around them. And so that last part, like honestly, that could be two days of teaching where we really then come back and share what we've learned. We start to talk about the connections. We dive into it deeper. We'll spend lots of time doing that before we get to this part where we really start looking at what happens. And so I want to break it down for my students um, into step one and step two. So photosynthesis, what is it? Water goes in, oxygen comes out in step one, carbon dioxide goes in and sugar is made in step two. So really making it simple for them. And then I'm going to give them some science terms. So again, making sure we talk about the words, we make sure everyone has an understanding, making them as simple as possible. So I'll do some direct teaching there. And then I'm going to let them practice. And so I've got a super sort for them to all do individually where they're identifying products and reactants, both the definitions and the products and reactants from photosynthesis. And then I'll have them just do a quick fill in the blanks. And all of these are self-correcting. So my students can practice as many times as they need to. So again, you know, different students process at different speeds, different students need more practice but I'm gonna give them the opportunity to do a little bit of practicing just to make sure that I identify any misconceptions they have with the first chunk of information that I've introduced. Then from there, we get to the equation, which is super fun, and I talk about this. And so I talk about the numbers, I talk about what the letters mean, and we'll make sure we spend a healthy amount of time breaking down, you know, We've got the reactants, we've got the products, the numbers tell us how many, it's all math that adds up. And then we'll talk about naming them. And then this is a lot, I'll let them practice again. And now here, I am just giving them a handout. You guys can grab one if you wanna play with it. And I'm asking them again to you know match the word that they read to that molecule itself and to go in and, you know, understand which one is a reactant. So we've got our reactants and we've got our products and they can play with that. And then as a teacher, I can come in and give them feedback as they're doing this. So this can be something that I support them with. I make sure they've got the scaffolding. I support them where needed. We identify those gaps before we move into the next part of the activity. And so then again, we're stepping it up a little bit more. I'm adding some more pieces. The standards want us to know about light reactions in the Calvin cycle. So we break that down again. Um, spend plenty of time talking about this. And then again, we get into practicing. And so here's where I really want them to be able to put the process and the steps into their own words. And I'm going to give them voice and choice in how they do that. Do they want to write a story, a song or a poem? Are they artistic? Do they want to create a comic for me? Or do they want to do a stop motion animation? Like what are the things they want to do? Or do they have a different skill? Let me know how they want to share their learning. So just getting them to put it together in a medium that they're comfortable with that shows me that they've put together that sequencing of those steps. Then once we've done that, I want them to start to reconnect that to their community. So, you know, I used shout it out with you guys earlier in the presentation. It's a great brainstorming activity. And again, the beauty of this is that my students share their ideas and they learn from each other's ideas and they see them all in one place. And so now I'm getting them to start to think critically about what might happen if there aren't many plants in a particular area? So going back to the connections we made to the community, thinking about the equation and the process, what are the consequences that could happen there? And once we've talked about what would happen if there aren't many plants, we'll do the same thing and we'll explore the benefits. And so what are the benefits of having lots of plants in an area? And again, this is an activity that oh, we devote more than the 10 seconds I'm devoting to now, but it really lets students share a wide range of things. And so 
I love, you know, we just got less beauty. Exactly. And like, what are the other pieces that we might see as well? So this really allows them to think critically. We've met the standard. We've addressed the pieces. You know, are all of my students going to be able to recite the equation for photosynthesis? Probably not. But if they know what happens if there aren't plants and if they know the benefits that plants bring, then they're now connected to this. And later on, when, you know, they are in a situation where they need to have an opinion or address some of the things that are a result of too few or too many plants, they have the ability to do that. And then the last thing I do with them is get them to reflect. So I think reflection is super important. When I think about reflection in the context of building a classroom community, you know, I want to look at, you know, what did I learn? I want to look at the context of that. What can I do with this learning? So really, you know, if I just taught you the equation of photosynthesis, you probably couldn't do anything with it. But when we start to look at, you know, the impacts and the ramifications of plants and plants in our ecosystems, then you can tell me some things you can do with it. And then the last thing I want you to do is really tell me how you helped your classmates learn, because if everyone is not successful, none of us are successful. And so building that in from the very beginning of the school year, that it is not all about you. It is all about all of us. Our job is to learn here together. And we're going to create a community where we all make sure that everyone is getting the support that they need. And this, you know, activity here, this is a handout. It's just between me and the student. And so it lets me understand where my students are in this process. And if there are challenges or things I need to address, it gives me an opportunity to do that with the student in a way that does not create that threat situation for them, because this is hard for all of us. And so we find the ways to make everyone comfortable and help everyone grow at the same time. So that was a lot in 15 minutes on the lesson, but you guys will get the lesson. You uh, can definitely explore it. Obviously I focused on science because I thought, you know, science and math are sometimes harder when we think about how do we incorporate culturally relevant teaching. All of the things that we did in this lesson apply to all of the subject areas. Um, and I'd love to hear your ideas about them. So uh, Katie, I'll turn it over to you for any last words of wisdom. I'll just say, I think that was fantastic, Chris. I think in particular, you know, there's things that are, quote, easier uh, to bring cultural relevance to and things that are, quote, harder to bring cultural relevance to, um, you know, like science, like math. Um, so, you know, the, the thoughtfulness in how we do that. And I think something, um, you know, something that pretty much everyone can relate to and lots of great feedback coming in, uh, Chris in the chat. And just to answer uh, questions around the uh, around sending out the resources, yes, please keep an eye on your email. We'll be sending out uh, the link to the lesson that uh, you've seen here and a bunch of other resources that Chris has put together for everyone. So keep an eye on the same email that you use to register uh, here today. You'll have all of those available for you. Uh, and we did have a question um, from Vasu in terms of how, how can I do this in high school math? Um, you know, I think Vasu and, and Chris, you might have a, a couple other points to jump in, but really um, think about these same ways that, you know, Chris took the uh, something like an equation and made it relevant um, to, you know, to their lives before even getting into the, the nitty gritty of, you know, your, your sine and cosine waves, for instance, um, really laying the foundation for why, why are we learning this? Why does this matter? And then getting into the, the meat so that students have a frame of reference. Um, and Chris, I'll let you jump in with the last word and any other ideas for Vasu from a math perspective. Yeah, I think for, it's all about finding those real world examples. And it doesn't, you don't have to connect every single thing because, you know, as we talk through this, A, it is about, you know, the, providing the context, making it relevant, but it's also about the community of learners who help each other succeed. So, you know, think about an example. How can you show when this would be useful in real life? Um, how can you connect it to your students? And one of the examples that I saw for math was like, you know, looking at gas prices and the rate at which they're increasing and then connecting that to the location and the people who live in that location. So how are we connecting, you know, gas prices to medium, median income and things like that. And so you can give those examples and let students work through them. And then at the same time, you can also build that community so that when it's hard, and students aren't necessarily getting all of it. They've got this classroom of, you know, at least 30 other students who might be able to explain it in a different way. And they learn to rely on each other as resources and to trust each other as resources. So it's those 
those two things we talked about in the best practices. It's building that community that helps each other succeed. And then it's finding the ways to showcase when you would use this in your real world. And sometimes you have to think a little bit about how to get there, but the benefit you get for every time you do it is definitely going to be worth the effort. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, for engaging in the chat, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Yay! Yay.